Maruchan superfans are everywhere. From the busy moms who want to deliver maximum flavor in a flash to dorm room diners who want to put some slurp in their step. There are a ton of copycats you could use, but if you want to bless your bowl, there's only one true Maruchan. Whether you choose instant lunch, ramen bowls, yakisoba, or restaurant quality gold, Maruchan is the only ramen worth obsessing over. Smiles for all, Maruchan. See what all the ramen hype is about at maruchan.com. Today on CityCast Philly, Philly is a union city and unions are set up to be advocates for workers. Recently, there's been a unionization movement within coffee shops, but some local workers want to get rid of their union. So why the setback? Lizzie McLellan Ravitch, workforce reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer, breaks it all down. It's Wednesday, November 29th. I'm Trini Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Hey, Lizzie, welcome back to the show. You cover jobs and workforce at the Inquirer. Lizzie, how did we get here? What sparked coffee shop workers to unionize? It's been kind of a whirlwind process. There's been a few different things going on. You know, I'll start on the on the more local end. Uh, this union called Local 80, uh, also known as the Philadelphia Joint Board of Workers United, they've been organizing workers at independent coffee shops in this area for over a year now. And they've actually kind of also had, uh, you know, a restaurant here and there. Mm. And, you know, you asked how we got here. Some of the issues that have been bubbling up in the organizing is workers wanting to have more say in how their stores are staffed or how they operate. Um, and they're just really complicated issues to work through. Now, Lizzie, you also reported that some of the unions still don't have that first contract. It's a multi-step process. So how long could this all take? A bunch of them are still working on a first contract. You know, um, for for those who maybe aren't as familiar with how the unionizing process goes, you know, the workers organize, they take a vote, and the employer can either recognize them on the spot and say, okay, I'm willing to negotiate with the union as the representative for my workers and come to an agreement on how we have a relationship as employer and employee. Or oftentimes that that vote ends up before the National Labor Relations Board or a state entity with a similar kind of responsibility. And they oversee everything and make sure that the labor law is applied um, how it's supposed to be so that the union can then represent the workers if that's what the workers vote for, if that's what they want. Um, So the local group I mentioned before, Local 80, like I said, they've been organizing workers for over a year in the Philadelphia area. They've held the vote. They've decided to be represented by the union, but they're still working on that first contract, that agreement between them and their employer about what the work is going to look like, how they're going to be compensated and all of those things. That on average, if you look at unions across all industries across the country, it on average takes over a year to get that first contract. Do we know how many cafes have successfully unionized in the city? That's a moving number. Um, I think last I counted, there were seven independent cafes um, that had unionized, but they've all seen different results. There's also a number of Starbucks that have unionized. Mm. There are several in Center City. Um, there's you know one near Penn Campus, and there's quite a few out in the suburbs as well. So if you look out in the area, those unionized Starbucks shops have really been popping up all throughout the Philadelphia region, though it's still not by any means, all of the Starbucks in Philadelphia. Lizzie, what are workers at these cafes or coffee shops asking for? So again, I'll start with some of the local ones. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about, about Starbucks, uh, which we all know is not just a not just a local small coffee shop. So one of the local shops uh, I've been following, for example, you know, they had some discussions with their employer over the lateness policy, how that's enforced and kind of what rights the employees have in those situations. Another thing that's been put out there is what do we do on days when people call it sick? How do we cover for that staffing? Is there another way, you know, some of the 
workers have proposed that maybe there's a new way we could go about um, having backup available on those days when a lot of people need to call out sick or have otherwise time off planned. Um, so those are just a couple of examples of, of things that either the unions or the shops have, have mentioned as uh, issues that they're discussing at the table. And I also mentioned I'd uh, talk a little bit about Starbucks and some of their proposals. You know, a lot of the unionized Starbucks workers have said staffing is a very consistent pain point for them, that they don't feel they have enough people working to get all the orders fulfilled in time. And they also this year were highlighting uh, the promotions that Starbucks puts out, especially in their app, as just another exacerbator to that stress of having a lot of orders to fulfill in a short amount of time with what they feel is not enough people to get all of that done. I understand. So Lizzie, what's been the response from management where employees are trying to unionize? In Philly, some of the local places that we've seen organize, the owners of the uh, of the shops recognize the union right away voluntarily. They didn't have to get anyone involved in in challenging that union or you know have a have the government step in. The employers just said, "Okay, I can see that a, a majority of you workers want to be represented by this union, and I will now negotiate with the union about getting a contract in place." There have been others where it's been a little bit different and the workers ended up filing with the National Labor Relations Board and having that official election and the employer then, you know, bargaining with the union over a contract. So it it varies. uh, And, you know, since we're talking about Starbucks as well, um, those have been a bunch of different elections at all the different Starbucks stores where workers wanted to unionize. So um, in those situations, they also had an election, and there there's more to say, I think, from both the union and Starbucks on how negotiations are going so far, but that's still a process that's going on. None of their U.S. stores uh, have reached a contract yet. Okay, Lizzie, you wrote about some recent setbacks facing union efforts. What's been happening now? As you mentioned, there's been a couple of setbacks. Um, one of them, this one store, Korshak Bagels in South Philly, they were the first one to unionize with the Philadelphia Joint Board of Workers United with Local 80, and their shop actually closed this fall. And there was uh, a good bit of coverage of that in the press. You know that that store was very popular. There were lots of long lines when they were closing for people who wanted to get in there and and have something to eat there before it, the the store closed. And the union members who worked at Korshak Bagels, uh, you know, there was a, a good piece in uh, Billy Penn actually about their perspective on the closure. And they had proposed some ways to streamline the business. They couldn't come to an agreement with the owner of the shop, Phil Korshak, about those changes. And ultimately, the, the business ended up closing. So while they were the first local 80 shop to unionize and the first one to get a contract because the business is closed that it could be seen as a setback for the union. You know, there's another coffee shop, Good Karma. They're locally owned as well. At Good Karma, the workers had unionized last year in 2022. Since then, um, three of the four locations of that coffee shop, they closed and one of them did reopen. So now there's two in Center City. And the workers at the two remaining shops voted to decertify the union earlier this fall. So what that means is that just like I was mentioning before, where the workers have to all agree and hold an official vote on whether to join the union, after they've been unionized for a year, they can have another vote if enough of the workers get behind the effort to remove the union as their representative. And from what I've heard, a lot of the workers who originally organized the union no longer worked at Good Karma by that point, which is why the result of the vote may have been what it was. But we can't really know that for sure. Is there still momentum for employees working at coffee shops here in the city? Or are some of the complications and the setbacks that we talked about um, having an effect on workers who want more leverage? I think if you ask the unions that are organizing, which I've done, recently, 
they would say there still is momentum. They are, you know, pushing toward these, getting these first contracts. And once they do reach that point, you know, that, like I said, that's a big milestone for the union to get that contract. And it can help to push things forward for other workers in similar situations. When I was talking to a union member at one of the locally owned stores recently, they raised a really interesting point that, you know, they said, we're here in Philly in each store, maybe a dozen or a couple dozen workers, not huge groups of workers. But if we win a contract and it's got these conditions in it, that will maybe give a framework for people at other coffee shops to organize. Or maybe it's even one that Starbucks workers look at when they are going to the negotiating table. So, you know, if you ask people who are organizing workers and people who are involved in the union, they will tell you that the momentum is still there, that they're moving toward the first contract, and that once they get to that point, they expect even more momentum and uh, framework for other people to reach that point as well. Lizzie, I'm curious, how different is unionizing for coffee shops attached to a chain, to a corporation like Starbucks, versus coffee shops that are local to Philly and maybe independent? So, you know, first I'll note that even among the smaller independent-owned shops, locally-owned shops, there's a lot of variety in how this process goes. However, one thing they have in common is that in a lot of those cases, the workers know their boss. They know the person who owns the shop. They've at least interacted with them, you know, in person quite a few times. And that is probably not the case in Starbucks. You know, Starbucks is a big company. Their workers probably have not interacted with uh, people who are sitting in the C-suite. And, um, you know, they're having this big battle over their first contract on a national scale. It's been all across the country that they're having these negotiations. So there's a different scale. And, and there's also something to be said for really knowing the other person on the other side of the table when you're a worker versus not knowing them. And maybe being across from the table from somebody that you've never met in person before and hasn't been inside your store with you before. Lizzie, as we wrap up this conversation, customers, you know, are really wrapped into their local coffee shops, whether it's a Starbucks or, a you know, an independent store. What does all of this mean for them, for the customer who depends on coffee and Wi-Fi and just the experience of a coffee shop in their neighborhood? Again, I think that will depend on the customer, right? And how they feel about worker organizing and how they feel about unionizing. I'll say that, you know, when I was talking to some Starbucks workers who were going on strike for Red Cup Day. Right. And Red Cup Day is a promotion from Starbucks and customers get a free reusable, you know, Red Cup after they purchase a holiday drink. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I asked them about that. I said, what do you want from your customers today? And they said, on that particular day, we would want our customers to not cross the picket line. We would want them to not go buy a drink from Starbucks while we are on strike. But on any other day, come on in, please tip well, treat the people who are working well. Because at the end of the day, right, you can't have a strong union without an employer to employ them. And you can't have that that business without customers coming in. So it's not as though the the unions don't want the customers to get the drinks that they want or the atmosphere they're looking for. A lot of times when you hear from the unions, they are saying that what they want is to be able to co- serve their customers better. Um, and from the employer side, they will tell you they also want a good experience from the customer. And if you were looking to see what uh, the two sides would agree on, I, I think that that would be a big part of it is that they both want their customers to, to be happy and to be able to continue serving those customers. Lizzie, thank you so much for joining me on CityCast Philly. Thank you. It was great to get to talk with you again, Janae. We'll have links to Lizzie's stories on coffee shop unions in Philadelphia in our show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Tell a friend about this episode. Rate the show leave us a review and hit that subscribe button. Be sure to sign up for our morning newsletter, Hey Philly, to learn more about what else Philly's talking about. 
We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.